Welcome to the one within all to the interverse. I'm your host, Chance, and today I've got an unexpected journey for you. A surprise return to the realm of Arda, Middle Earth, and the kingdoms within it that have made such an impact on the collective consciousness of our society through the book they derive from, J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, which is widely thought to be the second most read book of the 21st century in English-speaking countries, coming in only behind the Bible. And why would such a book become bigger than religions for some of our people? What is it about the myth and its language that allowed it to become so embedded in our psyche? Or is it that these symbols and archetypes have always existed, and that these tales resonate structures that we carry innately within us? These are just some of the questions on our mind as we prepare to take another deep dive into the lofty lore of realms like Lothlorien and Gondor, and the archetypal characters within these worlds, archetypes that you should be able to recognize and learn from even without knowledge of the stories themselves. And in supreme synchronistic timing, this week's episode comes off the heels of a fantastic show we did with Beth Martins last week exploring the psychological and relational aspects of archetypes, so we're well equipped to bravely march further on this journey now. And what a guide we have to show us the light today as we're joined by the alchemistic catalyst for heroism known as Laura Lee Scaife, a Jungian scholar, professional astrologer, and the creator of a video series called The Myth of Our Time, exploring the symbolism and lore of the Lord of the Rings through the lens of dream interpretation as a way to help us better understand society and our place in the world. It's an absolutely fantastic and well-edited set of videos that any fan of psychology, myth, or Tolkien should enjoy, and it makes a great case for the idea that myth is to the collective unconscious as dreams are to the individual. That is to say that myths that stick with us as a people are the expression of our collective psyche reflecting itself back to us. So check the episode description for links back to Laura Lee's video series and to her website where you can book astrology readings with her to find out more about how your archetypal blueprint is built. You can also, of course, as usual, find the second hour of this conversation on patreon.com forward slash interverse, where for five bucks a month you get double your fun with these podcasts. And there's a huge archive, including some other great Lord of the Rings episodes to find in there. Another series that you might want to check into would be the series that David Whitehead did with Laura Lee. Although YouTube recently flushed his uh, entire channel down the memory hole, I'll make sure and link to another video host that has that lengthy series they did together. Some very good podcasts with awesome visuals, too, about this very topic that you could really never exhaust completely. There's always more meat on those bones when it comes to archetypes and mythology and the mythology of Lord of the Rings. We usually don't even go past that book, and there's so much more to it. There's an entire cosmography that is amazing to get into that does tell us a lot about the way that our ancestors might have looked at the world, because Tolkien himself claimed to find the stories hidden in the languages that he was one of the few experts in the world able to even read from ancient texts locked away in old libraries and universities. But now it's time to get this show on the road. Because the road goes ever on and on, back to the door where it began, and I can't wait to get this journey started with this wonderful guest, who has the wisdom of Galadriel, generosity of Gandalf, and the bravery of Boromir, the one and only Laura Lee Scaife. Thanks for being here, and welcome to Interverse. Oh, thank you, Chance. What a, what a generous introduction. I hope I can live up to expectations here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, well, expectations. I'm... Those always cause so much trouble. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> well, I'm thrilled to be talking about Lord of the Rings. Of course, it's my favorite topic and uh, such a rich um, exploration. I mean, it's the gift that never stops giving. Um, I think we could probably take apart the Lord of the Rings um, over and over and over again and every time glean something new. I couldn't agree more. And I think even in our time now, it's becoming relevant in a new way as we see some of sure the darkness is. spreading across the land. I saw a meme of the Statue of Liberty made to look like Sauron, who's the big, bad, evil, black armor, scary demigod yep. from the series. And, you know, that classic flaming eye that people probably right. have seen in memes for years without even necessarily being aware of Lord of the Rings. The flaming eye in the place of the torch on the Statue of Liberty with the joke being, if you thought 2020 was bad, here's mm -hmm. 2021. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So anyway, what do you, I know this is a big question and you cover a lot in your series, but what are some of the things that we can derive from Lord of the Rings that would help us navigate our time? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I'll I'll start with that, but I I do want to touch on uh, that meme, the Statue of Liberty meme. Um, a little bit later, you were asking about the technique of amplification that I use to analyze the symbols, and uh, we can talk about that particular image, um, and and that will help uh, people understand how amplification works. So. We, we won't th let that go. But to start with, um, I just wanted to say that uh, my journey with Lord of the Rings did not begin until December 2001. Prior to that, I knew very little about J.R.R. Tolkien other than just, you know, reading references about his work. And I thought, well, you know, he, he's a children's writes children's stories and you know isn't that nice but I didn't go any further with it however um, at in the aftermath of 9-11 uh, September 11th 2001 which of course shook the world and um, then only a couple of months later here comes this incredible myth and I was immediately struck by uh, the power of the story and how it addressed what was erupting in our world uh, right at that time, which is evil. And the prior to um, 2001, I'd spent uh, the 20 years before that studying Jung and Joseph Campbell and astrology and various topics uh, related to that. But I got particularly interested in the nature of evil um, later in the like 1990s. Due to my studies of Jung, mostly I was looking, first of all, at the inner issues, you know, shadow, personal shadow, how do we deal with our own internal issues related to um, dealing with um, things uh, of an evil nature. But then there, there were things that were happening in the outer world in the later 90s that really caught my attention. So I began to look at, okay, so now that we've got some understanding of the way the personal psyche operates, wow, here's the outer world and you know, evil is on the march. And so what does that mean? So what struck me first of all when I saw the film Fellowship of the Ring was the way evil was portrayed. And it just, I, I thought, wow, this is, um, they've captured this. Or Tolkien plus Peter Jackson have, have been able to capture th this nature of evil in a way that um, had not been seen, or at least in my opinion, had not been seen in that way thus far. Plus, the, all the synchronicities of the fellowship appearing in uh, December 2001, and then the two towers, um, the name of Tolkien's second book in the series. And, uh, I mean, that in itself is pretty, uh, I mean, almost prophetic, that uh, in... 1953 or whenever it was that Tolkien published his work, um, the here is mentioned the two towers and what do we see happen on September 11th is the fall of these towers. Well, actually there was three towers, but uh, for the sake of our discussion here, um, the imagery is very powerful. And so I, I saw this Fellowship of the Ring movie and and by the way, I stayed with and have worked with the film version. I have read Tolkien's original work, um, but I'm not uh, an expert in that as much as, uh, I mean, I haven't spent as much time in with the novels as I have with the actual films. And the reason I liked the films was because of the dreamlike quality of the imagery. And my approach in the beginning was based on Jung and Campbell's idea that myth is to a culture what dreams are to the individual. And so if that is so, then there will be things going on in the outer world that... Um, 
tell us something about where we're at, certainly psychologically and perhaps even in the real world. So following along um, the idea that myth is to culture what dreams are to the individual, then I worked with a technique called amplification. Uh, this is a technique used in Jungian dream analysis and there, thereby you, uh, um, it's like connotations of a symbol. So a definition of, of amplification would be to find the connotations of a symbol uh, as a way of looking at all the different aspects of a symbol or an archetype that provides deeper insight into what it represents. And amplification is, is a very simple technique and it is simply looking at a symbol and we can use the example of the Statue of Liberty meme that you mentioned earlier. Uh, so looking at the Statue of Liberty, what comes to mind? Well, the first thing that comes to mind for me is Prometheus with the torch. Now, we'll talk a little bit about Prometheus later on and and. Uh, flesh that out a little bit more, but this is an example of amplification. So you have the, a Statue of Liberty, and then just what comes to mind? Well, Prometheus with his torch. The other uh, image related to Lord of the Rings that I would see there is Galadriel with the light Erendil. So there's two things right there to explore based on just the image of the Statue of Liberty. And then the fact that the uh, the meme shows this, uh, let's say, trans transformation of the the Statue of Liberty and what it's supposed to mean, you know, freedom and all all of that, then um, sh depicted in the form of the Eye of Sauron with the message 2020 looks pretty bad well hey get ready for 2021 see that that's an example of how um life imitates myth because people probably just about everybody knows what the eye of sauron is i mean even if you've never read tolkien you've never watched the films that meme as it were it, an image is is out there in the collective and therefore it is is a known it's known to be something bad isn't it it's like the all-seeing eye is what that's become in sort of modern i don't know truth or culture conspiracy research it's like you see that all-seeing eye and it's like oh evil that is the eye of sauron i consider well, that a, a corruption of archetypes that we're seeing the way that the uh -huh. statue of liberty the positive prometheus is transformed into this sauron archetype mm -hmm. that's yeah. it's this it's two sides of the same archetype because prometheus takes mm -hmm. the fire from the gods but the hero's journey is about bringing that back to your people right but the uh the Sauron character goes and steals the fire, but then tries to take that as a way to wield power over others. Right. Yeah. And, and this this idea really addresses the issue of why is myth important in the first place? Like, why should we even care about a fairy tale? Why Why would that be of any significance at all? Well, again, if myth is to a culture what dreams are to the individual, then we can take this particular story that comes to us at such a critical time in human history and and we can apply the the imagery or the understanding of the imagery to um, our current needs. I like what, so I, let me cut yeah. in here with a little bit about sure, that yeah. fiery imagery. You say the dreamlike qualities of the film and the depiction of evil is really good symbolism. And mm -hmm. you see every time Sauron is shown in someone's vision, he's just like surrounded by flames and it's all this mm -hmm. fire and wrath. 
And Mm -hmm. what we, what we look at as myth, we can do this amplification process with, we can try to take the meaning out of it metaphorically and poetically. We do that with other cultures, myth, and we Mm -hmm. find it fascinating. But a lot of us, when we look at the myth that's for our own people, like the desert sky God religions, as you might call them. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're taking those as literal stories, you're going to miss all the fire and wrath that's in those stories, especially in the old Testament stories. And you kind of miss the whole parallel between the, uh, (laughs) the Lord of those people and this type of, you know, wrathful Sauron, you know, the orcs were his chosen people, right? This idea of the chosen people, it gives us Mm -hmm. a lot of trouble if we are interpreting it in a purely external way. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and this thinking about myth as being like the the psychological operating manual for a particular culture, and their myths are related to a particular culture based on where that the the ancestors of that culture evolve. Hence the images of uh, the great north, the, the mountainous areas the uh, in in Lord of the Rings, where you know the these images of the the high mountains and the glaciers and stuff like that. This is where uh, the men of the West began. Some say millions of years ago. It's also where that, the fool begins his journey. He's descending down from mountains at the yes. beginning of the, the tarot, like the original exactly. hero's journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and so myth then is something that comes out of the depths of the psyche and really is in embedded in the relationship between body and psyche. So people the peoples of the different areas of the world uh, and the races of the world, their mythology grows out of the land that their ancestors evolved in and and the images that are around them. So what has happened to the men of the West is that much of our mythology and these ancient stories has been not only repressed but in in many ways demonized and thinking of the uh, like the christian mythology that comes later on i would say that the christian myth um is really based on this archetype of kingship that comes from the more ancient pagan cultures the uh the cultures of the arctic homeland What's wild, too, is I think in the book of Kings of the Old Testament, I think it's this book, there's a part where the uh, people are demanding a king and Jehovah's like, hey, I, you shouldn't have a king. Only only I should be your king. <laughs> and they're like, yeah. no, we need a king. We need a king. And then begins the story of, you know, the corruption of government, which I think the Bible is way more about than people want to realize. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that the seeds that the Christian mythology is based on really comes from this much more ancient story. And, of course, we know that Tolkien himself was a devout Catholic. Um, however, I I never really felt that his, well, and he himself said that this, sto- this story is not an allegory. Um, but he felt it was something that he was extracting from very ancient times based on his study of the languages. And, and so he said that this story came to him like, um, like the whole thing, like a whole story that he was just um, downloading, really, and, and discovering he he discovered it rather than made it up and and i find that really interesting and very relevant again to the idea that there is something much more ancient that has been lost to us as the modern so-called men of the west and why 
myth in just at large is important, but this story in particular is the myth for our time, is because it helps us connect to these very ancient roots, things that we we no longer really have any access to other than through studying and looking at archetypes and symbols that are presented in this myth. You know, as Galadriel says, much that once was is lost, for none now live who remember it. So this is a really interesting point. I actually want to pause on this point. Sure. Because what we have in America is a mythology that's been transplanted from another land onto this land. And yep. the mythology of this land is largely lost because there are none left who remember it. Mm-hmm. And it's get, it gets really weird when you start looking into real world artifacts. We talked about this briefly on the phone. And it's mm-hmm. something I'm, and I want everyone to look at because it's so wild that there are all these buildings that are old structures in really all, all around the world, but that have a, a historical narrative attached to them that makes no sense. And they can only really be rectified with the explanation that, well, that building was already here and someone came in and found it, found it mm-hmm. <laughs> as yeah. uh, the researcher, Howdy McCoskey, McCoskey says, I never get his name right. He, uh, his book I'm reading right now, which is about the World's Fair expositions. Oh, yeah. You were mentioning this. Yeah. He, he shows these pictures of buildings that are like 5,000 square meters, can hold 2,000 wow. 2, rooms of guests. The story is that it was, and it's all this elaborate stone masonry with crazy carvings, all, intricate all throughout, huge building. The story is it was built wow. in 53 days for a fair and then torn down one year later. But as Howdy says, these towns and stuff like Chicago and and all these big cities throughout North America, uh, Salt Lake City, San Francisco, Mm -hmm. St. Louis, there appears to have already been structures there. And when it's it's said that a city was founded, what they're really saying is it was found dead. And if our entire mythological underpinnings of our society is transplanted from an entirely different land, we don't even have the language that would have told us the story of where these cities originally came from. All we've got is the story is that a couple, a hundred years ago or 200 years ago, it was founded. It was found dead. And we don't, we can't see past that. It's really bizarre. That's fascinating. Yeah. Well, there's so many mysteries just of our day to day life um, that we, we don't know about that. There's so much, knowledge has been kept from us that you know where we are now in human history is like a time of discovering what has been lost and it's enormous what has been lost to us and the only means by which we've been able as modern so-called humans to discover some of this is is thanks to the internet thanks to this global communications network that has opened up all these doors to get information and to question information that we've been told uh, so that we can open some of these doors that have been locked. And so the good news about having the internet and I think why they want to shut it down is because this is this is the philosopher's stone. This is the thing that has um, given us at least the opportunity to question the ruling order and to to look at our world from some different perspectives that will help us uh, access some creative part of ourselves to deal with the, the problems that we are presented with in our time. And the, this, there is certainly a prophetic quality to Lord of the Rings. And as we know about dreams, too, you know, you, you've got your kind of everyday run-of-the-mill dream material, but every once in a while, some people will have a very powerful prophetic dream that that will you know maybe not appear in their life in a blow by blow way you know like i dreamed i saw so and so and they did this and that i mean it it may appear symbolically 
but the message of some of something important that is coming in the future is is a part of prophetic dreaming and i think the same applies to myth you oh, know just let me another, make a quick yeah, point about yes. lord of the rings to tie into what i just said a minute ago too is that Many of the big monolithic structures and cities in the story in Middle Earth are mm -hmm. from previous civilizations, and then someone else right. has moved in. The mines exactly. of Moria, empty, yeah. amazing, unbelievable architecture. Even yeah. Gondor, the yeah. white city, that yeah. those people couldn't can't even fix the city because they've lost yeah. the, the mastery that yeah. their forefathers had. Or mm -hmm. minus Morgul, where the Nazgul have their headquarters used to be a Numenorean city. Mm -hmm. There's probably several more that I could name that are mm -hmm. like that in the tale. Yeah. So that's yeah. maybe a form of prophecy to connect back to what I was talking about. That's the dream of myth showing us that um, mm -hmm. we're standing on the shoulders of giants, maybe literally. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it, it ties in um, – a bit too, again, the events of 9-11 uh, and the synchronicity of this story appearing only a few months later. But what was going on in um, actually just a few weeks before September 11th, there was an opposition of Saturn and Pluto. Now, the Saturn-Pluto cycle is what we were dealing with last year in 2020. And the studying the, the cycles of Saturn and Pluto are pretty telling right there that every time Saturn and Pluto come together, it, it's a time of what I call boil lancing, that Saturn and Pluto both deal with shadow, Saturn primarily personal shadow, and Pluto being more archetypal shadow. So the importance of dealing with personal shadow is that if we as individuals are doing our own personal shadow work, then we're less likely to be leaving the door open for archetypal evil to creep in and essentially take over the personality. So this ongoing cycle, this dance between Saturn and Pluto, which uh, occurs, the full cycle is roughly 35 to 38 years. And you can trace this all the way back as uh, Rick Tarnas has done in his book, Cosmos and Psyche. You can trace it all the way back, I think, to like four 414 B.C. or something. And, and you can see these evolutionary processes and shifts going on um, every time Saturn and Pluto come together. But the ultimate essence of Saturn and Pluto is about confronting shadow and dealing with evil. And so what happens then, so the beginning of the cycle in this case with the one we're talking about uh, that culminated in 2020, that was that's the conjunction of Saturn and Pluto. Conjunction means they come together, they merge together. And that initiates this cycle of 35 to 38 years. So what was coming to closure in 2020 was set in motion in November of 1983. Now, just looking a little bit into the history uh, of what was happening in the early 1980s, well, it was the, the aftermath of Iran-Contra. There was a lot of things that were being revealed at that time that were, were exposing some of the shenanigans and, and evil doings of uh, what I call the foe, the forces of evil, the military-industrial complex, the corporate banksters, and um, all, all of those who profit from this kind of mayhem and chaos and war. So that so in 1983 was the initiation of the cycle of Saturn and Pluto that came to closure last year. But the halfway point of that cycle, that is the opposition of these two planets, occurred just a few weeks before 9/11. And I think that was such a shock to the the collective human psyche that it, it really knocked, uh, I think, most of humanity into a state of, well, fear, 
and trepidation and um, made people at large vulnerable to being manipulated by this kind of psychological warfare that preys upon fear. So if you instill fear and terror into the population, then they're more likely to submit to control and domination. So we certainly saw that after, in the aftermath of 9-11, and then the cycle comes to, to closure last year, and what do we see? Same old story. Forces of evil rolling out uh, another whole agenda, uh, you know, trauma-based mind control, terrifying people to the extent that they're they're willing to submit to just about anything, including anal swabs. So this is um, this is letting us know that what we are facing right now is not a new thing. It, it's you know, a process of bringing into consciousness this this dark, destructive aspect that seems to prey on humanity and has been doing so maybe since the beginning of time. But why is this myth so important right now? I would say because of this Saturn-Pluto conjunction that took place last year and we're now in the first year of the new cycle what's interesting there, too is there's a 19 year metonic cycle which is that the moon comes back to the same place mm -hmm. every 19 years so 20, right. 2001 and 2020 are connected mm -hmm. by that metonic yep. cycle rolling back to where it was in 2001 yeah so there's mm -hmm. even more like there's a lunar uh, yes. Links there oh, too, yeah. and I mean uh -huh. the symbolism of the moon. It yeah. would probably, if you were trying to do some like trauma-based mind control programming of the unconscious, you'd want to hook the moon into that ritual too. So it really is some perfect uh -huh. alignment. And this would be a good place to even consider amplify amplification with the symbol of the ring. A lot mm -hmm. of people might not even quite make the connection that the Lord of the Rings is Sauron, but that sounds a lot like Saturn, and Saturn has the yeah. ring. So there's a big link That's right. there. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and that is a perfect I example of uh amplification. Like what comes to mind when we consider these these powerful archetypal symbols that resonate at, at some deep level in the psyche. And so so I can go through a little bit of the uh uh association with the ring. Yeah, Should let's go through now? some of that, but okay. also let people know that part of your series, there's two parts on the ring itself. And mm -hmm. so to really get into just that one symbol and amplify it, we can't even do that in one podcast, but we can, no. we can give, take a stab at it as a way to segue yeah. further in, <laughs> into other topics, just to let people know though, that there's just that one symbol has so much to it. The ring is the circle, mm -hmm. one of the oldest archetypes, perhaps the first and original archetype, if you think about it from a sacred geometry perspective, mm -hmm. which your series does, which I thought was really cool. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I'm, the ring is pretty much the main character in the story, the the ultimate antagonist, right? And so unpacking the symbolism of the ring, where, where I started was, was to say, okay, well, the ring, a ring is a 3D version of a circle. And, of course, the circle is a symbol of the human mind in relation to larger cycles of nature and time. It, it is one of the most ancient symbols. And in my series, I talk about a man named Michael Tellinger, who um, professes to have discovered the oldest uh, stone circle. So human beings have been building these stone circles, of course, the most famous one being Stonehenge and other ones in uh, Ireland and, and Britain. But why the circle? You know, why a circle? Why is that so important? And why does Tolkien use a ring and therefore with the background of the circle and the Euroboros then uh, following from the circle, the Euroboros appears in about 1600 BC 
And there it's an integration of assimilation of the opposites. But what's interesting about Tellinger's work is that he, he suggests that the stone circles he discovered in South Africa are like 75,000 years old. So that's another little little bit of info that comes to us that nobody ever knew before. I mean, we when when were when is Stonehenge supposedly been erected? Uh, is that is that the date, the real date, or is it something far far more ancient? The same with the pyramids and other structures around the world. But since we're talking, hell, about it applies circles, to the Capitol buildings of United States yeah, cities. Yeah. Yeah, I mean those buildings. I really think it makes more sense that someone else built it than the people that had just horses and buggies and wood log yeah. cabins back then. I mean, it just yeah. doesn't it doesn't compute. And there's literally this is why mystics and, and alchemists are always trying to get people to look into the mystery of the cathedrals and things like that. Like, mm. where did mm. these things come from? Why did they? Why do they harmonize with the architecture of the human body to the point where just being inside some of these buildings actually causes you to feel more energized? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this whole, the whole mystery of all of this is opened up just by thinking about the ring and the symbolism behind it. So the circle, the 2D version of a 3D ring. So we start with that, and then from there, of course, the Euroboros as a symbol of integration and assimilating of the opposites, and then the, the zodiac uh, uh, following from that, the evolution of consciousness in, in the alchemy of time, that would be related to the zodiac. And then... Um, Sally Nichols, a woman who um, did a lot of study, Jungian study on the Tarot, she said that words express man's ideas, whereas numbers express God's reality. So from there we go to the circle as a zero. Now the zero was really unknown until the 12th century. And think of you know what this having the concept of a zero did to our our intellectual evolutionary development, and from there go goes into the uh, sacred geometry because there we're getting into numbers. So then we were talking about um, the the geometry of the circle which ultimately becomes so moving from the 2D circle into the 3D ring what we have there is the torus t o r u s and and i unpack this in more detail in my uh episode on the ring for anybody who wants to really dig down into this but it's it's really fascinating the whole geometry and and then how these um, the geometric patterns that are seen around the world in particularly the flower of life image that shows up on temples around the world and when you look at the geometry of that what it all boils down to is the um, the the hexagonal shape the hexagon, the six-pointed star, which is also depicted in Lord of the Rings as Galadriel's ring, Nenya, has that six-pointed petal design, as does Arwen's uh, necklace. Her jewel that she wears around her neck is a combination of the six-pointed star, the uh, meta or the butterfly symbol of metamorphosis and also the the image of the caduceus all of that is contained in arwen's jewel which is really relevant because she gives it to aragorn and in yeah. the books they even they don't describe the way the jewel looks in the book the way that you can see it in the movie and i think they did a mm. great job mm -hmm. with the symbols they put into that jewel but it was so important of a symbol representing the archetype of the king and the components of the king which we can yep. we'll probably talk about later the four 
aspects yeah. of the king archetype, yeah. which is so cool. Those are kind of contained yeah. in that stone. Mm-hmm. But in the book, the stone was so important that the people of Gondor, when they, whenever they received Aragorn as their new king, they called him Elfstone. Yeah, there's a different word for it that is not coming to mind for some reason. Elisar. It meant, it meant yeah, Elfstone. Elisar. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that was the sim- literally the symbol of what made him the king. And uh, to amplify uh-huh. that symbol, the way they did in the movie with the uh, imagery they gave to it, I thought was really relevant, despite the fact that they didn't incorporate the fact that the, he was called Elfstone by his people. They had to leave out a lot of linguistic things that just don't translate from a page to a screen the yeah. same way. But Right. And I want to talk about Ouroboros a little more because mm-hmm. this... Mm-hmm. I think we can tie it back to where we started a little bit, which is Mm -hmm. ironic since the concept of Ouroboros is that eternal return. Mm -hmm. But when you break it down in a word magic way, you're saying our Ouroboros, which is an expression of the fact that, yeah, yeah, the infinite emerges from nothingness. Mm. It's kind of an Eastern idea, but Mm, I love that. One of the things I really like about Michael Tessarion's work is Mm -hmm. the, he points out the existential fact that thinking about nothingness changes thinking. In a, yeah. And it's really important because I think that on an archetypal level, zero and one, this binary, yeah, the whole and the pole, the masculine and the feminine, the input and the output, that type of concept, if we repress the zero within us, which is also the shadow, it's the unknown, it's the unexpressed mm-hmm. infinity, the feminine, in a way, mm-hmm. that everything's emerging from, that egg, that's what the, mm-hmm. zero, the zero sigil tells tells the whole story. But yep. in, if we unbalance ourselves towards the, the one or towards the yang, the masculine, the fire, that's why evil looks like that. Just fire and yep. wrath and no water at all and everything's dry. And the, the desert sky god religion came out of the desert. Like mm-hmm. those type of climates created that type of mentality. And, and the female, female characters like Galadriel, she's like an eternal being. She's literally existed from before, t- before time started being counted. She's from the yeah, undying land. she's more than 10,000 years old, apparently. She's definitely the zero in that sense. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the water and the feminine. I just think that's really yeah. interesting with Ouroboros, to, that that concept, even in the word, is telling us that we come from nothingness. But that's the, uh, And why the ring can be also like the dark shadow of that archetype as the Sauron character and all that is because an aspect of that yin energy or yielding or zero or nothingness is that there is a a sort of a drive in all life to return to stillness and void. And it's counterbalanced against the active drive, the desire, the will to, you know, to do not just be, but if you go too yes. far on one side or the other, you either get nihilism or you get domination. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the the um the notion of um moving from say two D to three D with regards to the ring, uh what we see is this incredible symbol of power the power the driving force uh of the life the life force of the universe is the taurus so the and just to explain that it it, there's lots of images that you can look at and many that i talk about in my series that shows the the way this energy system is structured and it's it goes from the smallest to to the largest, from the smallest particle to the movement of galaxies and and everything else. Everything is made of this Taurus dynamic. So that gives some insight into why the One Ring is so powerful. Because it contains the knowledge of the life force of the universe. So no wonder the forces of evil would want to have control of that power. And if the knowledge of how the Taurus works is kept from the people, then we, the people, don't know how to use our own power and our own energy, our own bioelectric field that connects to the the 
source of life in the universe, we we can't make that connection because all of this knowledge uh, has been kept from us until now because we are discovering this power and learning how to, first of all, understand it, be aware of it, and ultimately to harness that power. Because my feeling is that at, at the end of the story, at the end of Lord of the Rings, after Aragorn is crowned, he, he says to the people, you know, look, um, this day is not for one man. This is not about me being the best guy and the king and everybody bow down, but rather that we have to now come together to rebuild this world based on the new age of men. So the new age of men, as far as I can interpret, has to do with this understanding of the power of it coming from science, right? The the um, understanding of the way this Taurus system works. And we now are being required to basically uh, aspire to elvishness. The, the tale is left there for us now. We are now the men of the West, men and women of the West who, who are called upon to create this new world and the elves have have already left meaning that we are now required to integrate what elfishness is as something that we are equipped really um, to aspire to and perhaps it is the it is within us based on ancient times whether it's Atlantis or, or other ancient civilizations that rose to great power and destroyed themselves. And in Lord of the Rings, there's the, the ages go on, and there are many times throughout that whole story that uh, the, the, um, the battle is lost. Well, also but, Sauron, when he was getting started out before he went on full world domination mode, although he was planning it, his backstory is that he would go to like the elves and to the dwarves and he would seem like he was there to help them, but he was actually just stealing yeah. their lore. He was just like a knowledge scavenger. Yeah. And a vampire. it's a perfect example of how power differentials work in the modern time, which is that That's right. the elites like that classic quote. Millionaires don't use astrology. Billionaires do. There's yeah. something to the <laughs> astrological alignments of things like 9-11 and things like the 2020 events. And mm -hmm. they are they are planned with the sky clock in mind. And that knowledge differential lets it work. I think that's even how evil works is really not, yes. that the, not so much that the lies hurt us, but that the obscuring of the truth and not being able to reach the truth is what is hurting us. And exactly. like you said, we like going back to being more elvish as you put it, would mean that we need to take back the knowledge of our forefathers and our ancestors from this machine that mm -hmm. Sauron has built. Otherwise, That's we'll never right. be able to stand up to it. Yeah. And that, that, first of all, requires a more sophisticated understanding of evil. And, and what I find really shocking, actually, looking out into the situation we're currently in is the incredible naivete that most people have uh, about evil. Like it's just, if you mention evil, there's, you know, you get sort of a blank stare and, and, and a, most of the time it's like, oh yeah, well, you know, yeah, we don't have, really have to worry about evil because, you know, that that doesn't exist now. It's actually all relative. You know, it's just relative to your culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like no, no big deal. In other words, we, we don't really have to even think about that because, you know, we're, we're modern humans and we don't need to worry about evil because there isn't really evil. There's some bad people, but you know, is there an archetypal force in the cosmos that literally feeds on life evil is live or live spelled backwards there's a pretty powerful wordplay right there 
Oh yeah. I it, point that out all the time. I mean, it's like, yeah. I couldn't believe I went 30 years before noticing it. I know. I know. Isn't that funny? Like, yeah. Uh, it, it's one of those mind blowing things that it, it, it's so simple. And so self-explanatory that evil is anti-life. It's against life and it eats life. It cannot produce anything on its own. It, only, it feeds off of that which is created. So that's a really important thing to grasp. And, you know, probably most of your listeners are already on board with that. But the, the initial revelation of just that it is almost psyche shattering, you know, to, to break through into an understanding of, oh, okay, there's an anti-life force in existence right now and it it is literally on the march because so many people simply will not even consider that there is evil and that's what allows it to to keep preying on us now i think that is changing especially after the events of last year. Uh, I mean, millions more people, I would say, are awake in the most positive sense now than than were prior to last year. Don't you think? I do think so. I actually, okay, <laughs> this was like, to me, a big deal, but not, okay, so I'm going to talk about my little sister. She's not that much littler. She's in her... Uh, mid or late twenties. Right. But oh. she was, she went to medical school. She didn't actually oh, okay. go into the medical field, but she got trained in nursing and biology and all this mm-hmm. stuff where they definitely put wow. into you all of the, you know, the basic Rockefeller yeah. medicine crap. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And she's never been like a closed minded person. None of this is like against her, but she just had all the reason in the world to believe the mainstream version of things for a a long time and then just the other day though i mean she saw everything that was going on in 2021 or in 2020 and now this year i think it was the censorship that really blew her mind because she was like i'd have conversations with her about vaccines and she'd be like well i don't agree with you and it wasn't Mm -hmm. combative it was great we could talk about it but then when she saw that no one could even say the word on facebook and that was before (laughs) the censorship even got bad during coronavirus She's like, this is weird. And then everything that's happened with censorship since then has uh, opened her up to the point where she's like, where can I, where do I even start to learn about this stuff? Like, <laughs> oh, great. And I was yeah. like, get a membership to Unslaved and just pick and choose some stuff there. <laughs> that's a and good watch place Lord to go. Lord of the Rings. <laughs> oh, well, luckily she's a huge Lord of the Rings fan. That's oh, one of the things great. we bond over. So she's got Wonderful. the mythic. And, you know, she like, this is funny. I'll have to tell her she's been talked about on my show a bunch but you know she reads constantly she's a big fiction junkie and i think that's actually really good for your brain yeah absolutely yeah because it opens the door to the imaginal but okay so i want to point i I want to talk about the imaginal i'm sorry to cut in but we're actually getting closer to the to the end of this first hour and i want to take this conversation of evil into a new realm for a moment here because a lot uh-huh. of people that are in the waking up phase, especially last year or maybe in 2019, uh-huh. they still fell into this controlled awakening corral that has been set up, for, you know, like the next matrix outside of the matrix uh-huh. of the belief that there are white hats in positions of authority in the military uh-huh. and the government. They're going to yeah, fix yeah. everything for us. And I want to think about that idea and what I consider to be a fallacious idea. Uh, in context of Gandalf's refusal to take the ring, because would he not have been the ultimate white hat? So why couldn't, I mean, literally, like you think of him, he's Gandalf the white, he wears a, mm. he doesn't wear a hat when he's Gandalf the white, ironically, so there is no white hat. But yeah. yeah, you see what I mean here? I think that we can look at his refusal to take the ring and then think about this idea of white hats and why maybe they just can't really exist within the structure of evil. Mm. Well, to start with, I would say that if people are having an expectation that there are individual humans out there 
called white hats who are going to step in and and fix everything that that that's a function of projection and the the big problem and what i think really has um contributed to this waking up um experience over the last year it is the realization that when there is a need within the culture for individuals to bring forth within themselves these powerful archetypes like the king, the wise man, which Gandalf would represent, and, and of course the warrior and the lover that we'll talk about a little bit later. But I think what what your question gets to is that we we're in a time in human history where so much of of our own personal power ha has been uh, repressed. I mean, we've been so de depotentiated uh, and infantilized by the effect of the foe on our world that's been going on for a hundred years, right? This suppression of information, um, the building of these control structures and institutions and the you know, pushing of, of resources up to the higher echelons, the so-called elites, the 0.002% that this, this whole business has been going on for a very long time. So the people, and particularly the men of the West, have been so uh, depotentiated and infantilized that they no longer have access to kingship within themselves or this wise man idea. So the the belief in white hats are going to save us or Donald Trump or anybody else who, who appears to be um, a king or a leader, if we expect someone in the external to do that for us, then we are projecting and the that is never going to work, as we saw with the whole business of, of Donald Trump. He was carrying the archetype of the king for the people who needed, who need to bring that forth out of their own selves instead of projecting it out and waiting for some, you know, big guy of one sort or another to, to fix it all. So the fact that the Donald um, carried that to a point that it started to stir up this king, wise man archetype within the people it is a very important thing. And coming back to Gandalf's ref refusal of the ring, uh, well, Gandalf refused to take the ring because he was enough aware of his own shadow that he knew he knew that he would try to use the ring to do good but through him it would it, it would take over and and do terrible evil so this brings it all back to personal responsibility and the awakening in within the collective of the king the, the one who is able to master his own inner realm. And after doing that, then can stand up and say, okay, you know, I've mastered my inner demons and now I can step forward as somewhat of a leader, not so that everybody can project onto that, that leader person to take care of it for them, but rather to help individuals rise to their greatness in their own life and become mature adults instead of these little children who are expecting mommy and daddy in some form to take care of everything and uh, and then we don't have to grow up. So this is a, a real 
loss of innocence for humanity at large that we're undergoing, a loss of innocence and a consequent uh, maturation, psychological maturation, to realize that nobody's coming to rescue us. Not the aliens, not the white hats, not any external person who's who's uh, pretending to be powerful. This is about individual development first and then coming together with others who have matured and, and are able to support each other in rising to their greatness so that we can, in fact, rebuild the world in the notion of the new age of men. And you know what? Aquarius is like the man of the Zodiac in a way. Yes. The representation of man in many ways. Man, this topic is so interesting. You had my brain going all over the place. I was thinking about how. <laughs> I know, it's great. The most useful thing I ever got from Young was the realization that I don't just project shadow onto others, but virtue too. That I put Absolutely. my virtue out on someone else and said, they're so talented, I could never do what they do. Yeah. And I learned that actually the difference between me and my heroes is the time and effort. And aptitude is really a function of care, not a function of mm. innate potential. <laughs> right. With yeah, the exception a- of some physiological problems. But also the other thing is that in even within evil is the seed of good, which is a tough thing to swallow. But even worm tongue shed a tear when he saw the army of orcs that was meant to be the doom of his people yes, that he had supported. Right. He still had that little bit of of humanity left to feel, uh, you know, compassion and and to feel um, sadness and grief at at what was going to happen to his own people. Not the courage to stand up to it, but (laughs) which is why I think that we can reach a lot of there are good people in the institutions that are evil. But by being by playing their role, they're not allowing themselves to rise to that potential of goodness by following orders and and all that. So I think the way that we reach them and the seed of good within them is by taking up our own conscious kingship and all the other positive elements of the archetypes and building, building the new thing that is more attractive to them than their <laughs> hierarchy of safety and security at the exchange of freedom. But that's right. We got to wrap up our one as mm-hmm. <laughs> I hate to quit this flow because it's so fun, but we'll jump right back into it. Let people know where they can connect with you and what you can do with them. Uh, Well, the best place to uh, connect with me is my website, and that is llastrology-lotr.com. And uh, all my uh, information is there. I'm uh, an astrologer. And so there's information about uh, the astrology work that I do, which is based on, of course, Jung and mythology and the notion of uh, finding your own personal myth. And uh, that based uh, on the archetypes of the planets and signs, which are, of course, gods and goddesses. So that's uh, that's my personal work, and then also on my website are uh, the presentations, my uh, five episodes of um, uh, my Lord of the Rings series, and um, that's uh, yeah, that's all there. Wonderful. And that's how people can reach me. Yeah. I thank you so much for your time. It's been a blast. The first hour was really quick. Hour two. Yeah. We have a lot of stuff left in our our general outline here, but some of the things you might expect to hear people would be why evil exists, why it's allowed to exist in the universe, uh, more about archetypes at play in Lord of the Rings and probably a big focus on the king archetype, which is so great because that's where we kind of had to slow down last week with Beth when we were talking about the primary archetypes of the hero's journey. Didn't plan it, but these two episodes fit together like puzzle pieces. Mm -hmm. Synchronicity. Yeah. So we'll talk about that, maybe get into ancestry, maybe cymatics, Mm -hmm. maybe more about the magic of language and Mm -hmm. that Prometheus that we teased at the beginning. Those are some of the things you might hear in hour two. No promises, though, because any one of those topics could just blow up to the whole thing. We'll see what happens. And (laughs) thanks for being here. (laughs) 
One ring to rule them all, and in the darkness, bind them. Yes, indeed, that's the end of this episode. Wrapping it up here, but... You know, I never really want to be done talking about Lord of the Rings. It's just one of my favorite topics out there. The beautiful thing is how synchronistically it flowed on from talking to Beth Martins last week because this archetype of the king may be one of the things that we left on the table more than other things in the plus extension with Beth. So in this plus extension, we really get into it and have the Lord of the Rings to use as a great example for that king archetype. Uh, what are the, some of the other things we talked about in the plus extension this time? Well, we refreshed the, we were, we caught us all up on the Tolkien cosmology, which is like the story of where did the universe come from and what are the gods and how is everything created? And of course it's like a creation story created for a created story, but it also seems to exhibit some really fascinating wisdom about cymatics and about how maybe on a Kabbalistic type of perspective, how the monad divides itself into a multiplicity in order to generate the physical world. So there's some, there's some of that in there. We also talked about uh, why is there such a thing as evil? I think we maybe got that, that going in the end of the free hour, now that I think about it. I don't know. It's hard to remember <laughs> where these things all hashed out. I do have notes in front of me. Look how professional I am. <laughs> We talked also about the uh, ancestry, what it means to maybe psychologically to not know our ancestry the way that our ancestors would have known their ancestry, and also on cymatics, like what that might have to do with being able to verbally recall stories and songs and even the names of our forefathers and foremothers. Would that actually summon in some type of cymatic energy? And that's a big question. Maybe I'm giving too much away. But I want you guys to get into the second hour plus in the plus extension because it was more than an hour. I think we went maybe 10 or 15 minutes over and I probably could have kept her on the line longer. But <laughs> my cat had escaped out the back door and I was worried about that and I needed to go make sure he would be safe and come back. My cat is named Peregrine Took. Also, I call him Tookie. I got a dog named Gimli, and I got a cat named Gandalf, so that's how much I love Lord of the Rings, even before I started doing podcasts about it. Other things in the Plus Extension, we talked about the Age of Aquarius and the myth of Prometheus. So, plenty, plenty, plenty of juicy things to get your teeth into there, or your ears, I guess. For uh, only five bucks a month, yeah, really easy to do these days. I mean, are we getting a third stimulus check set aside, like... You know, you can even sign up for a year on Patreon, just buy it all at once, and then you don't have to worry about a $5 charge coming out for a monthly deal. So yeah, I'd love it if more of you signed up. I got a lot of nice support in the last week. I think some really great people found our little tribe because of the show with Beth, and I'm not surprised because the work she does and what I intend to do here seem pretty damn aligned. Maybe a different way of going about it, of course, but we have the same goal, same sights, which is the unfolding of our greater potential in harmony or something like that. <laughs> do I sometimes just sound like I just throw out like new age word salad? Because I've been accused of that. But I know what I feel when I talk and I'm, sometimes I'm just in a flow state and things are just coming out of me and Maybe I'm kind of hungry, maybe I'm kind of tired, maybe I'm kind of stoned, who knows? I just say stuff, I try not to overthink it, and here I am doing that exact thing. But uh, what else is there to even say in this outro? You know what, I think I want to talk about what possibly inspired the series that Laura Lee did, which I think is worth checking out. Those videos are pretty cool and very well edited. And it's an article called Tolkien at the End of Time by Jay Widener and who else? Let me pull this up. Jay Widener and Sharon Rose. And they wrote this really interesting article about the alchemical secrets of the Lord of the Rings and the possibility that you're actually getting some sort of real history out of this story. If you hear that meowing, that is the cat I talked about before took and he needs to go away but I'm in the middle of this, and uh, ironically, I didn't shut him out of the room. Once again, he gets to be mischievous. Usually, I keep them all shut out while I'm doing these things. Anyway, 
You might have even been able to hear that. I have a pretty good microphone that suppresses sound. So uh, if you didn't hear what I was referring to, a cat came in the room and started screaming. But anyway, what I think might be going on, and I do recommend that article, Tolkien at the End of Time. What I think might be going on is that as a scholar of languages, Tolkien had access to, and this is not something I think is going on, this is a fact, he had access to libraries of ancient works that nobody else could really read. Others that might be able to read it weren't interested or maybe didn't have the same understanding that he was able to drive from it. Because look, it's one thing to be able to read the text and another thing to be able to get it and maybe see deeper into it. And even to an extent, the words themselves seem to tell a story to this guy who had such a love and passion for language, which I think is beautiful and very magical and also very crucial. So what we know about colonization, I guess you could say, is that at different times in history, people come in and they wipe out a group of people other than maybe some of the weaker, younger people and take, make them start speaking a different language, enslave them, yada, yada. Next thing you know, the language they had before is gone. If they had any written works, so they're unreadable. Maybe they didn't even have written works, and so the stories are lost that would have contained their history. And then, boom, it's gone. Game over. As Galadriel says, there are none who left to remember. <laughs> so that's something that could definitely happen. And when we talk about this character of Sauron from Lord of the Rings, and I'm pulling a little bit of inference out of this Jay Widener article, but... It's theorized that maybe Sauron represents Saturn, which makes sense because Saturn has the ring, right? But another thing about Saturn is that he has to do with time. He's a timekeeper. And man, if I haven't, if you haven't heard me before speak about this, I guess I'm not going to go off in a tangent now. But the entire matrix in terms of like the control of humanity and the corralling of our attention and energy and uh, the slavery system itself is all built on timestamps. You couldn't have it without time. I mean, without the time that humans artificially created. I'm not talking about the natural flow of objects moving from place to place that in coordinated synchronicity feels like the passage of something called time. I'm referring to having like a clock with a schedule and a calendar and everything being lined up and centrally managed. And the first guy that history tells us, or one of the first guys that history tells us did that, He's a cat named Sargon of Akkad, a Mesopotamian king, I think. Uh, and so Sargon sounds a lot like Saturn. What could have happened back then when this one king, the one to rule them all, maybe it wasn't this guy, maybe it was a different guy, or maybe it was a group of kings working together. Maybe they're all influenced by some similar type of demonic spirit. That's another question. But they could come in and just wipe out people who were peaceful that maybe because they'd had such good times for so long, they were easily corrupted or easily defeated. Who knows? But this could be the fall, that the fall of a man, if you will. And maybe it wasn't even that long ago. Maybe even the idea that the text that Tolkien read, that he got these stories from being 6,000 plus years old, or referring to stories that old, I'm not sure which. Maybe that's not even on the mark. Maybe... Our chronology has been tweaked in a way that makes things seem further away that weren't even that far away. Who knows? But there's so much research you could do that I think is really fun about looking at artifacts in the real world. Of not artifacts so much as like architecture, megaliths, what have you, and questioning the story of where that came from, right down to things that are under our nose every day, like Capitol buildings, even downtown in the not very large town I live in. There's buildings that. If you start looking for the evidence of some kind of, uh, well, ad advanced construction abilities and then maybe possibly uh, mud flooding, as they call it. I see this in my own area where there's buildings that are half buried on the first floor and doors and windows that go to nowhere. And if that's all new to you, I'm. I've tried to introduce the concept many times. We're going to eventually get into it in full-fledged shows. It's just about finding the right guest that, and I'm still researching the topic. But my point is, if these languages that Tolkien could read because he studied them were telling a true story about a real takeover, and maybe, though, the difference is that <laughs> Sauron won. He actually won, or for a time, he won. And that it's uh, definitely now our time to destroy that ring of power, to end our enslavement to the machine. That's another thing that 
the Widener article goes into is how the ring is kind of like the machine. Artificiality, technology, even art itself, all these things could be wielded with the intent for good and wind up causing terrible evil. Even technology. And look, I'm on technology talking to you. I'm just thinking here. But what things do we no longer have the ability to do without the technology that maybe we used to have the ability to do without the technology, right? So that I won't say it's all bad or it's all evil, but there's something to be said there. That even something that was made just for convenience and had no ill intent could weaken us in the long run by making us dependent on it. And Sauron's definitely dependent on the ring. As soon as it gets melted, he's gone. Everything, all the air gets sucked out of everything, right? So, interesting thoughts. Uh, I think that that ought to do it for this show. Remember, you can support me on Patreon. I almost said us, but it's just me. I'm the only one that makes this. I do everything you see on the internet and that you hear in your ears that comes from Interverse. That's all me. So the more support I can get from you homies, the better, because I'd like to put more full-time effort into this, but uh, got to make money other ways. I've found other ways to make money, and it's going really well, but... I still want this to be my main gig and maybe even put time towards other types of research and other types of projects, but I'm getting ahead of myself. First, I need your support to give, I mean, I don't need your support to do other projects, but you get what I'm saying. It'll help. And you know, I kind of do need your support because eventually this needs to be my, my main gig that is producing me the living money I need to stay healthy. And because if it becomes that, then I will be much better at doing it because I'll be able to relax and be able to do so much more, travel more. That's what I really want. And uh, it only costs a little bit from each of you. Help me attain that dream and be the best podcast host I can because, you know, if I started traveling, it's going to really expand my mental map and help me as a host and with my perspective. And you'll like that. So help me help you. And I'm going to play us out with a really weird electronic music kind of mashup remix of Lord of the Rings type music from something I found on SoundCloud. So it's an old random remix off SoundCloud. Those are always fun. And uh, with that, I'm out. Oh, hey, wait. You can support the show in a gang of other ways. Check out the show notes in the episode description. Scroll down to the end, and there's like multiple things you can do. Like leaving a review on iTunes, for example. And if you're new to the show, of course, remember you can subscribe everywhere that podcasts are served. There's video versions on YouTube. No video version of this episode. Laura Lee didn't have the tech for that. But almost always there's a video version where you can see me and the guest talking, which is kind of cool. And uh, even on Patreon, you can get a video version of the extended second hours of the show. Okay, now I'm really done. I love you guys. And uh, may the force be with you. I mean, wait, that's the wrong fantasy universe. Okay, see you later.
Ah.